So whether it's changing the banking system or sheltering a gang of smelly radicals, she's fighting for us. Ladies and gentlemen, Ann Emmett. Money, uh, money uh, is not neutral. Surprise, surprise. Money is not neutral. How it's created and who gets to do that has terrific implications. Now, while money was designed as a medium of exchange to facilitate the uh, exchange of goods and services that we all depend on for society to, to function, uh, and uh, it has become predominantly not a medium of exchange, but a medium of power. Money is a medium of power. An important distinction, and there are a lot of problems because we, we don't make this distinction. Money is not wealth. Those two things are very, very different. Now, politics and economics are two sides of the same coin. That's why what has come to be called economics used to be called political economy, which was a much more truthful way of speaking about it, and one that I think uh, uh, we should adopt. And so, for example, austerity is not a solution to an economic problem. It's part of a political process that begins with the, uh, the creation of money by banks out of nothing, by private banks, and it ends with the confiscation of wealth around the world on a global scale by what Occupy has identified as the 1%. Basically, there are two kinds of money. Government created money and private banks created money. Government created money is essentially debt free. It's created by the bank, uh, the central bank, the Bank of Canada, and that money is spent into the economy. Bank created money is lent into the economy. Debt grows exponentially. It's like a science fiction horror film. <laughs> it swells taxes, it diminishes revenue, and it becomes an excuse to shrink social services. Government-created money stimulates the economy and promotes economic and political stability by enabling the government to maintain purchasing power for government and for citizens. Bank-created money empowers banks and other corporations to influence government policy. Government-created money frees the government to act in the public interest. It enables democratic control of priorities like job creation and environmental problems in a mixed economy. Money created by private banks, on the other hand, puts private profit, profit before people and the environment in a market economy. It perpetuates the boom-bust cycle and ensures ultimate total collapse. Today, about 97% of our money is created by private banks. They get the profit, we get the debt. That debt is used to justify the implementation of a neoliberal agenda. You know, trimming government, cutbacks, privatization, and then when the system fails, we bail them out. Fair and prudent finance. The cause of our national debt, and this, this is so important, the cause of our national debt is that our financial system is based on debt. 
That's the cause of our debt. Now, only government can create debt-free money, and only the government, uh, uh, therefore, is, is responsible for what we know as legal tender. Now, that's why only about 3%, that's why we're lucky to have, to have even 3% of our money supply created by the government. Legal tender means that it's money that has to be accepted in payment. If you are offered cash to pay uh, what you are owed uh, and uh, you turn that down, the debt is automatically canceled. You can refuse a check or a, or a credit card, but you cannot refuse legal tender in payment of a debt. Now, when a private bank creates money, it essentially is substituting its promise to pay which is accepted as money for your promise to pay, uh, which is not. Banks do not lend their depositors money. It's crucial to understand that, and it's a very common misunderstanding. Banks don't lend their depositors money. They create money. And the money supply of Canada increases at the moment a bank makes a loan. There are many things wrong with this debt money system. It promotes excessive competition that leads to monopoly. Bad practices like excessive, uh, like uh, built-in obsolescence, for example, and of course, waste. It's extraordinarily wasteful. Let's focus on two major problems. This system favors creditors, and it makes debt slaves of the rest of us, nations and citizens alike. The, in the rise of Canada's one, uh, richest 1%, Armin Yalnitsyan, who is an economist with the um, uh, CCPA, the, Central, uh, uh, the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, reports on a study by two economists, Emmanuel Says and Michael Veal, which shows how both in the US and Canada, long-term trends uh, towards equality were reversed after 1980. Until 1980, certainly between the end of World War II and 1980, the difference between the very wealthy and the, and the rest of us went like this. By uh, 2012, that had been completely reversed and we're back to about the same place we were on the eve of the Great Depression. <clears throat> Incomes of the very rich doubled and tripled while they flatlined for the rest of us. And worsening debt and uh, increasing prices exacerbated that situation. She points out uh, this distinction then about the difference between inequality. And I heartily recommend the book by Joseph Stiglitz on the price of inequality. The implications of this are very clearly discussed in that book. How are we doing? Okay. Instability is another outstanding fee, uh, flaw of the debt money system. It's one we've all experienced one way or another. Everybody, everybody in this room, I'm sure, has. Thomas Jefferson understood this problem very well as far back as then. In a letter to the treasurer, he wrote, I believe our banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation and then deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the ground that their, uh, their, their forefathers conquered. Now, money, remember, is the lifeblood of the economy. Too much in the system, and money loses its value. Too little, 
an economy shrinks. At either extreme, the economic system fails. Now, banks can create only the amount of the loan, the principal. They cannot create the money to cover the interest payments. So there's never enough money in the system. Hence, the growth imperative. The system must grow or die. On the one hand, as Naomi Klein points out in This Changes Everything, this has come to a state of war between the economic system and the planetary system. What our economic system demands is unfettered expansion. What our planet needs to avoid collapse is a contraction in our use of resources. <clears throat> On the other hand, debt grows faster than income. Surprise, surprise. Because we have all sorts of ways of uh, causing debt and uh, precious little ways to increase income. And in fact, much of the policies that have accompanied these other policies have diminished income. And that comes as no surprise either. So when debt exceeds income, that so, to such an extent, and I think in Canada now, the average household debt is 165 times the average household income. When, when that happens, um, and people uh, cannot or will not borrow more, indeed can't keep up with, with the interest payments, and or banks grow unwilling to lend, the system crashes. Hence the occurring and intensifying pattern of booms and busts. Now, these, this pattern characterizes what John McMurtry, in his book, has explained as the cancer stage of capitalism. Nobel economist Michael Hudson argues that we've gone about as far as we can go, fueling our economy with debt, and that we are on the verge of a catastrophic depression of unparalleled magnitude. The dramatic bust of 1929 brought Canadians, uh, taught Canadians a lot about money and banking and focused attention on the need for a central bank. We didn't have a central bank before that. A royal commission greatly influenced by the work of a Canadian hero you probably never heard of, Jerry Grattan McGeer, appeared before this committee and greatly influenced it. He was a brilliant lawyer from BC who campaigned for a public central bank and as a liberal MP greatly influenced Prime Minister Mackenzie King. That commission recommended that Canadian Central Bank be established. The Bank of Canada opened its doors in 1935 and in 1938 was nationalized. We own that bank. We have a bank of our own that can create money with more legitimacy than private banks can create money and create it in the same way. We are outstanding in having a public central bank. And um, um, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, Stiglitz who points out, I think, yes, it's Stiglitz who says, say what you like, all central banks are public and they should be uh, meeting the needs of the society that they have been designed or should have been designed to serve. At that time, Prime Minister Mackenzie King said this. He went on, the, on a, a radio broadcast and he said, once a nation parts with control of its currency and credit, it matters not who makes that nation's laws. Usury, once in control, will wreck any nation. Until the control of the issue of currency and credit is restored to government and recognized as its most conspicuous and sacred responsibility, the sovereignty of parliament and democracy, any talk of those things is idle and futile. 
The Constitution gives Ottawa exclusive power over money, banking, and paper currency. And Article 14.2 of the Bank of Canada Act established that in the case of a conflict over monetary policy between the government and the governor of the Bank of Canada, the Minister of Finance shall serve notice to the governor of the Bank of Canada and the bank will comply, shall is the word, the bank shall comply with the government. The bank's mandate is to regulate credit and currency in the best interest of the economic life of the nation. This nation, not the bank for international settlements, not the private banks, not the corporations, the economic life of this country. The depression ended only when governments all over the world forced their central banks to put, put forth a whole flood of new money to finance massive government deficits at near zero interest rates. And between 1938 and 1974, Canada demonstrated the truth of Abraham Lincoln's comment that government's control over currency and credit was not only a responsibility, but also its most creative opportunity. So between uh, 1938 and uh, 1974, we did all kinds of things with that money. We built the Trans-Canada Highway, the St. Lawrence Seaway. We funded uh, universal health care. And I saw a clip of uh, Tommy Douglas just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get hold of that. You, sh you really should see it. You should hear Tommy Douglas talk about the relationship between the Bank of Canada and the health care uh, program, which, of course, we're losing step by step through privatization. In 1974, Canada joined a committee at the Bank for International Settlements, and at that, that's a bank for, uh, it's a central banker's central bank. And at that, uh, at, at that, that committee recommended that um, governments not borrow money from private, uh, from uh, their central banks, that central banks not lend money to governments. And since then, our government has ceased to provide what it provided up until that time. And that change in policy has cost in interest on the federal debt alone $1.1 trillion. $1.1 trillion on a debt that never should have existed in the first place. Successive governments since the end of the 80s have borrowed instead at compound interest from private banks. And we pay, and we pay, and we pay, and we're losing every social mile we marched over the last God knows how many years, certainly since 19. 1938. How am I doing? Oh, you're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't want to keep you here until you're all asleep. <clears throat> Einstein said, we can't expect to solve our problems at the same level of thinking as we created them. And in the early 70s, Galbraith wrote a wonderful little pamphlet, a book, very small a, a, a paperback, entitled Economics and the Public Purpose. And in that book, he argued, there must be change. But the first step has to be, and I love the term that he used, the first step has to be the emancipation of belief. 
David Graeber, in a recent uh, article, David Graeber is an anthropologist. And this is one of the wonderful things that's happening. People in all sorts of disciplines are beginning to make the connection here. David Graeber has written a book this thick about debt, the first 5,000 years. And in this article, David Graeber talks about how revolution works. And in that article, he says this, we have to rethink what we thought we knew. We have to rethink what we thought we knew. Well, um, what are some of the things we need to rethink? Still OK? <clears throat> One of the things we have to uh, rethink is concepts that we have about things like work and wages. What is so almighty wonderful about working that you should spend most of your life, first of all, learning how to earn a living. Secondly, if you're lucky and have a job, earning a living. What's wrong with making living the priority? What's wrong with looking not at wages, not at a living wage as, as uh, unions think is the next step, and, the, and what they consider a, a living wage, I sure wouldn't. Not a living wage. What we should be considering is purchasing power and everybody's right to it. It's a commons. It's one of many commons that have been taken from us. It's your right purchasing power. So what would be wrong with something like a guaranteed annual income that would free you for three days out of a week to paint pictures, to play the violin? Mm -hmm. To think, John McMurtry, uh, who wrote The, ca uh, the uh, Cancer Stage of Capitalism, in that book says, most people think what they were taught. And the barriers that are being set up through the mechanisms owned by corporations and banks to people's thinking or even learning how to think Boy, what an attack on education, for example. I taught. I can't believe what's been happening to education in this country since I gave it up. <laughs> no, co no, no connection. <laughs> <laughs> we have to think, OK, OK. We have to think about uh, 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 poverty, for example. Poverty is not an economic problem. Poverty is a crime. There is no excuse for poverty whatsoever, and charity isn't going to do it. We have to think. <laughs> we have to think about what we can afford and not afford. What we cannot afford, we can afford anything physically possible and desirable. What we cannot afford is to trash our young people. They're graduating debt slaves. It's a crime against them. What we cannot afford is to trash the environment, for God's sake. I beg your pardon. <laughs> if there is a future, it won't be because a panel of experts sat around a table and drew up a beautiful blueprint for a lovely new world. Not the way it's going to happen. If there is a future, it's going to happen because ordinary people like you and me did what we could. <laughs> enfin, le fin. <laughs> we can have both our money, and our life. It's there. We can have it. We have the mechanism at hand. We have to elect to public office people with the understanding, the integrity, and frankly, the guts to manage our political economy in the best interest of the common good. This should be the issue in the next federal election. We must choose 
life over money. John Hodson, who was one of the primary um, co-founders of Comer, who taught economics at Waterloo University, John Hodson said, could anything be more insane than that the human race should die out because we couldn't afford to save ourselves? Merci, bien, mes amis. <laughs> For a moment, I thought she was going to scream fuck to it and flip the table over. Uh. <laughs> so next. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up is a man who has been described as Canada's unofficial opposition. Uh, as someone to whom other lawyers pay very close attention to when they want to know what's up with constitutional law. Uh, his cases, except for this one, always receive lots of media attention, but they always receive attention from activists across Canada. Among his cases, after the Summit of the Americas in Quebec in 2001, uh, he was the lawyer who challenged the legality of the fences that were placed around the old town. Um, in, uh, he also uh, recently challenged the C-24 uh, bill, which uh, would have stripped certain Canadians of their citizenship. In 2014, he challenged and defeated uh, Harper's nomination of Marc Nadon to the Supreme Court, uh, which is a very important case, which set a very important precedence. <clears throat> and soon, assuming it passes, he'll be leading the charge against C-51, the secret police bill. But all this is just his part-time job, <laughs> which he does pro bono for free. Uh, otherwise, to finance these activities, he's a home renovator, and that's how he pays for what he does. He was educated here in Montreal, and now he's back to tell us what's up. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rocco Galati. Merci beaucoup. Pour moi, ça fait à peu près 30 ans que je ne pratique pas mon français, donc je vais donner mon discours en français, mais je suis disposé de prendre des questions en français après, et je vais répondre en franglais. OK. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, and I, I also want to welcome, you know, the two or three CSIS and RCMP officers that generally attend, <laughs> attend my talks. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and there, a lot of them are quietly grateful for, uh, to me, particularly on a day like today, because if, uh, being here, they're, tri they're clocking triple time. Yeah. It's Sunday, so. Uh, some of my friends with the government department uh, I uh, often joke that I'm, you know, apart from being called things like the unofficial opposition, I'm a one-man make-work project for the security services and government lawyers uh, because of the challenges we bring. All right, I can't, I, I, you know, I, I can't talk Anne's talk. And like most of my clients, I don't understand a word she said. I don't know what she's talking about. But uh, I try to follow my client's instructions. And, uh, uh, okay, so th 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 she's given you basically the socioeconomic and brief historical uh, orientation to the Bank of Canada and why the Bank of Canada is important to this nation. I just, as a lawyer, my ability to affect and translate that into 
legal and constitutional rights is much more restricted. And so the challenge for any lawyer, and I imagine there probably are some lawyers in the audience, is to translate the econ socioeconomic uh, theory and history and then translate that into a recognizable legal remedy, because the courts are not in the business of running the economy. The courts are not in the business of making nitty-gritty, detailed socioeconomic uh, decisions. The courts are a very blunt instrument. Uh, I'm not saying that that reflects their mental intelligence. Sometimes it does. Some judges are fairly blunt. But uh, what the courts can't do is say, build more hospitals, uh, provide 22 more beds. The only thing the courts can do with respect to socioeconomic policy is declare or strike it down when they find that it's contrary to statute or unconstitutional. And so I'm going to talk to you about the Bank of Canada from that uh, a, a circumscribed legal perspective. And so, uh, as Anne said, the Bank of Canada was primarily created in 1938 as a public bank to provide low and interest-free loans to the federal, provincial, and municipal governments, uh, provided they were paid back in the next fiscal year. Maximum with the federal budget, 30%. Maximum with the provincial budget, 25%. When it was created, they could also provide directly to the municipal governments. Dur during the post-war years and into the 60s, the provinces start to complain, saying the municipalities are our creatures. Municipalities are governed by provincial law. You're, uh, sir. Somebody isn't here. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, who's not here? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so they removed the ability of the federal government to provide the the transfer, pay, the, the, the interest-free loans directly to the municipalities. Now, that's ironic because after that, the, the evolution of constitutional law in Canada recognized the federal government's spending power, and that, and the spending power to equalize services across the country was embedded in Section 36 uh, of the Constitution Act 1982 in terms of the transfer payments. Section 36 says that the first ministers are required to have a meeting every so often to ensure the Canadians across the country are getting comparable services at comparable levels. Not an exact science, but so that somebody in BC is not dying because they can't get a hospital while you have a, a Cadillac service in Ontario, for instance. So there is nothing stopping now the federal government sending the municipalities directly interest-free loans so long as it comes out of its 30% loan from the Bank of Canada. So basically, the first part of the challenge to this, to, to this court action is to force the government to do what it's required to do. It's not as if we're trying to create a new law. The law has never changed since 1938. The government has simply, since 1974, chosen to ignore the law and chosen as a blanket absolute policy never to again give low or interest-free loans to the government of Canada and the provinces. Well, in constitutional terms, that's called abdicating your constitutional duty to govern. You can't do that. What's more atrocious and egregious is the fact that not only have they relinquished or abandoned their constitutional duty to govern, they've handed it over to foreign private interests. And that's a relinquishing of sovereignty. Uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, some of whom, uh, some, some people in this room know, who's the Dean of the Privy Council of Canada, he was, he was a cabinet minister under the government of Louis Saint Laurent, is also a part of, a member of Comer. Uh, he calls this giving over Canadian sovereignty, sovereignty o over banking to private European bankers treason. Now, while I've never said it's treason, I find it very difficult to argue with Mr. Hellyer over the point. Uh, and so these are the constitutional problems that we have when the government does this, and people assume they can do whatever they want. Uh, they can't, they're not supposed to be able to do what they, whatever they want in a constitutional democracy. Now, uh, the, other, the other problem with the Bank of International Settlements is that I, I'm sure most of you in this room, because you, you, you seem to be educated on the point, 
All the, central, all the other major cen central banks in the G8 country are not public banks. We are the only country that has a public central bank. The Federal Reserve in America is a private bank. Just because, just because the Federal Reserve shows up at congressional hearings from time to time doesn't mean they're a public bank. They're a private bank. The Bank of England is a private bank. The uh, Bank of Italy is a private bank, so on and so on. So what we've done is we've given our banking governance to a bunch of private bankers who are there only for profit. And there, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very serious problem in, in statutory and constitutional terms. Now, the, the, the shares in the Bank of Canada are held by the Minister of Finance in trust for Her Majesty the Queen. In, 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 uh, in basic terms, that means the Minister of Finance holds the shares of the bank for the people of Canada. It's our bank. And so he, he is supposed to, he or she is supposed to be acting in the best interest of the Canadian economy and in the best interest of Canadians. Well, you don't do, you don't act in the best interest of anyone when you're giving the store away to your friends over in Europe or down in the States. That's just the bottom line. Uh, now, the second part of the lawsuit, which is tied into the first uh, uh, part of the lawsuit where the Minister of Finance is the trustee for the shares in the bank, is the budgetary process. And the reason the budgetary process is important because it's what leads to our debt and then interest in our, uh, to a yearly deficit which gets piled onto the debt and the interest on the debt. The budgetary process has not bas basically changed since the Middle Ages. It comes out of the Magna Carta. And the budgetary process goes something like this. And most people don't know uh, Paul mentioned that I renovate. I don't want to get the wrong idea. I do renovate. My brother and I, who's a lawyer, who's never practiced law, uh, every year we would take a property, renovate it, because we're interested. It's in the blood. We're Italian. Uh, and, and then flip it, and that's how I subsidize my cases. But the other way I subsidize my pro bono cases, too, is that I started off as a tax litigator for the federal government. In fact, I have a master's of law in tax. That's my primary expertise. Tax revolution and constitutions are inseparable. Every single revolution that has been undertaken in Western democracies has been a tax revolution. What is tax? Well, tax is one side of the budgetary process. We exact your labor and your wealth, and then we take it and we spend it to redistribute it and socially engineer society in accordance to the whim and government of the day. That's the budget. And so how does this manifest itself every, every session of parliament? Everybody gets dressed up in you know, uh, medieval pageantry and the Supreme Court Canada judges are in their Santa Claus suits and they knock on the, on the doors of the House of Commons and they all sit down and there you see the Governor General with the Prime Minister, the Supreme Court judges, all the MPs and the Senators, because most people confuse uh, confuse uh, Parliament with the House of Commons. Parliament is both the House of Commons and the Senate. That's Parliament, okay? And so the Governor General, on behalf of the Queen, is laying out the, the anticipated expenditures during the session so that the Commons, the MPs, can vote to tax to give that money to the government to spend. The government cannot tax. Only Parliament can tax. And so when you watch that on TV, the speech from the throne, that's a constitutional requirement. They can't just impose taxes without it. And, if they, and the reason why if a budget is not voted in, the government has to collapse, why? They have no money to run the government. That's why it's called a non-confidence bill. There's no longer any confidence in that parliament because they, they, they can't just get the money out of thin air. They got to tax it. So here's the sleight of hand and sort of fraud that happens in Parliament uh, every, 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 every session. What the government does is it says, here are our anticipated revenues. Let's pick an example which has been typical of the last few decades. $280 billion is what we need to run the government for the, next, for the year. We have anticipated revenues of 240. Therefore, we're short 40 billion. We have to borrow 40 billion. Well, that's not really true or accurate. 
The anticipated revenues are not the gross anticipated revenues. They're the anticipated revenues after you kick back tax credits, refundable tax credits. So we may be pulling in not 240, but maybe 350, 400 billion. Now, why is that important? It's important because if the MPs had in their hands those numbers, then they can des decide, well, where are these tax credits going? Why don't we shave some of them and forget the $40 billion deficit? Why is that important? That's important because everyone in this room has a constitutional right not to be taxed without representation. It's the old no taxation without representation. Now, all of this has been codified in sections 53, 54, and section 90 of the Constitution Act. That, that, mag, that, that right from the Magna Carta to the English Bill of Rights of 1689 of no taxation without representation is a constitutional right which we read in through the preamble of the Constitution where it says that we have a Constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom in 1867. Post the patriation of 1982, in the education reference from Ontario, the Supreme Court of Canada, Mr. Justice Iacobucci's decision, confirmed that even post-charter, the right to no taxation without representation is still a constitutional right in Canada. So if our MPs don't know what the true anticipated revenues are going to be, how are we taxed with representation? If I knew as a citizen in my riding, I could approach my MP and say, forget the deficit, shave the credits. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that they have to listen or agree, but at least there is the necessary democratic debate in the House, in the House of Commons over this issue. The way they present the budgets, most of those dumb MPs don't even know what the real anticipated revenues are. They're too, inti they're too intimidated by the you know, uh, a, a lot of MPs are intimidated by issues of nitty-gritty economics and budget and taxes. They just don't take the time. They don't have the time. And often the government rushes these, these bills through omnibus uh, uh, provisions with all sorts of other junk in the works that, that doesn't give them enough time to debate or look into the issues. So this is, these two go hand in hand because the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Finance, the one who, pr who puts forward the budget is the same guy who holds the key to the Bank of Canada. And that person knows. And over the years, municipalities have written to the Minister of Finance and said, we want you to ask for a loan from the Bank of Canada, interest-free for this amount for our human uh, for infrastructure projects in our municipality. And the letter that goes back, it doesn't matter if it's a liberal or conservative minister of finance, it's the same letter from the bureaucracy every time says, well, we can't do that because the, quote, the banking community wouldn't like it and it would create inflation. Well, that's, that's a metric ton of horseshit <laughs> for two reasons. <laughs> yeah. for two reasons. One, the banking community are a bunch of greedy, oppressive private actors. What do we give a shit what they think about our, our government policy, our public policy? Who cares if they're not happy, first of all? Second of all, uh, <laughs> second of all, this notion of inflation is nonsense. Inflation is a very com complex phenomenon that, you know, although economists pretend to know how and why it happens, there is no magic formula. It's not like splitting the atom, okay? Uh, so, for instance, between 1938 and 1974, if you take all those years when we were getting tons and tons of interest-free money, the overall inflation rate was lower than it has been from 74 to the present, first of all. It didn't bother President Obama or, or, or uh, Prime Minister Harper to give the banks, in the spa space of 26 months, one trillion fucking dollars so that they wouldn't go under. <laughs> one trillion dollars. Obama gave them, Obama gave them 800 billion dollars. Our government, in the open, gave three banks 60 billion dollars, otherwise they might have collapsed, and then secretly, 
assumed another 162 billion in toxic CHC uh, mortgages for a total of a 220 billion dollars, which is almost, almost the budget for an entire year for Canada. And that didn't cause any inflation, all that interest-free money. Not only was it interest-free, it was a gift. It was given away. So that's why that notion of, uh, and now, as a lawyer in court, this is not the debate I have to engage in, except only to the extent to debunk assertions of fact being made by the government that we can't do this because it would cause inflation. Well, then why did you do it with steroids a few years ago? Okay. Now, the second thing, the second thing that people should be on notice is uh, Rob Flaherty, when he was finance minister, and Rob Flaherty, was, as, as a human being, was a sweetheart. I can tell you that from Ontario. Uh, and he had, you know, he was, he was really, uh, a lot of his measures were never put in, even though the government uh, promised to put them in. In the last two budgets, he put Canadians on notice, you know. Uh, if I tell you that I read the budget papers every year and I look at them, uh, you probably think I don't have a life, but it's because I'm a tax lawyer. I need to know what's, uh, <laughs> I, I have an interest in this historically and constitutionally. Uh, in the last two budgets that he oversaw as finance, finance minister, how many of you heard of the term bail-in? Not bail-out, bail-in. Show hands. All right. So, uh, let, me, let me explain to you, sorry, 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 suckers, what bail-in means, okay? With the first fi financial bank crash in 2008, the governments, the U.S. and Canadian governments, bailed out the bank debt. Just gave them the money, they bailed them out. Flaherty said, never again. He put us as taxpayers and depositors on notice that were bailed in to the bank. When you deposit $100 into a bank account, I have some news for you that you probably don't know. The money belongs to the bank. It's their money. All you get in exchange for that $100 in the contract is a promise return for the principal and interest on that money for the bank's use, even though it's only one quarter of 1% on some accounts. So what happens if the bank goes bankrupt? Well, you as a depositor are bailed into their bankruptcy. You're bailed into their debt. And as a common depositor, you are a simple creditor under the Canadian bankruptcy laws. So you will stand in line and you will get your portion of the actual money on, this, on the system. Uh, that's it, what they call in reserve. The bank reserves right now are 2%. So for every $100 that you deposit, they're only required to keep $2 in reserve. So you will stand in line and get two cents on the dollar if a bank goes bankrupt. And all of you are saying, oh, no, 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 but I saw the commercials. My bank account, <laughs> 60000 is guaranteed by the insurance fund. That's true. But the entire global maximum of that fund nationwide is $2 billion. So maybe you'll get another quarter cent uh, in addition to your two cents. That insurance fund is a placebo, OK? It's only $2 billion. That's nothing for a nation of 35 million people, all right? So understand this. You are bailed in to the bank's debt. And people ask me, you know, when I talk at conferences, well, you think what ha almost happened to Cyprus could happen in Canada? Yes. I say no. It's already happened in Canada. <laughs> in 1992, in Alberta, a trust company went bankrupt. Mr. Justice Este, uh, 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 Este of the Supreme Court Justice, ran a, uh, uh, you know, an, an inquiry. At the end of the day, I think those depositors got eight cents to the dollar. So, not can it happen, it's happened, and of course it happened in the Great Depression, big time, okay? So this is where we are. Uh, so we are allowing private bankers in a foreign country 
not only to determine our banking policies and everything else, but to hold us hostage to their private profit needs. If you look at the budgets since we've been running deficits to the present, it's uncanny. It's like a, dr it's like a drug addiction. I used to prosecute drugs, by the way. Uh, by the it's uncanny. It's like a drug addiction. The interest on the debt every year is almost to the dollar the deficit. We're borrowing to pay interest every year. Now, last budget, we had a deficit of $28 billion. We had no, sorry, interest payments of $28 billion, which was the, the deficit. $28 billion in the budget is more than what we spend on the entire defense budget in Canada, even though we're at war. $28 billion is more than the federal government transfers to all the provinces for health care or education. The interest component of our national budget every year hovers at around 10 or 11 percent. It's the biggest one ticket item. It's the top fucking item on the budget. Our debt, our enslavement. And I promise I wouldn't swear. But you know, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm, so, I, 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 I'm sorry, Anne. It's, it's, it's an honor my mother just passed away 18 months ago. She taught me everything I knew about uh, colorful language. You know, she, she, she raised 13 children. She didn't have time to be nice. When she, made, when she spoke, she had to be fast and to the point. So it's our biggest ticket item. How many of you are acquainted? I lived in China. My first, uh, my first spouse was, uh, was Chinese. I lived in Ch off and on for about four years in the 90s. How many of you are acquainted with Chinese history and the opium wars? Good. The Western countries forced the Chinese to buy and consume opium. Even though it was bad for them, it was part of their economy. We are being forced to consume interest on debt, which is all unnecessary. That's what we're doing. That's, we've been turned into interest addicts, right? And not just on a national scale, but you notice how while everybody, everybody sounds the alarm, oh my God, every Canadian, not counting their mortgage, on the average owes 95000 well, the people lending the money aren't concerned about it. Only people concerned about Canadians. Because not only have we been turned into debt addicts on a national level with respect to our governance and our banking and our, uh, our policies, we've been individually turned into interest addicts, debt addicts. And that can only lead to one place, enslavement. I mean, it sounds dramatic, but it's enslavement with a smile, in color, with Twitter, with Facebook, you know, with a whole bit, but it's enslavement. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> All right, so the trajectory of this case so far has gone as follows. We launched it in 2001. 2012, there was a motion to strike at the first level of the federal court. Proto notary, who's like a master, a quasi judge, and he struck the whole thing saying it's not justiciable. The courts can't decide these issues at all. I appealed it to the federal court. Justice Russell said, no, no, no. The statutory, st uh, the statutory, uh, the statutory duty and the constitutional breaches, the declaratory relief as to what the law is and what the government should be doing is justiciable. You can go ahead. But I had. Uh, I had also attached a tort claim for damages under the charter for the individual plaintiff so that uh, we wouldn't get struck as, a, uh, you know, they, they say you can't run a private reference through declaratory relief. Anyway, making a long story short, uh, uh, the government appealed our win at the second level because the court said we could pursue the declaratory relief. and. It went to the Federal Court of Appeal this January, and the Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the government's appeal. So they said it could proceed on that. Now, there was a little window open. Uh, the court said, instead of proceeding on what's left, it struck the, the, the claim for damages, uh, redraft, reamend the whole, the whole pleading, uh, just to make a, and if the government's not satisfied, you know, if there's anything for them to object to, they can bring a motion to strike. 
Uh, they may be bringing another motion to strike uh, because they like to wear people down. They don't have a prayer on winning this motion to strike because the court's already decided it's just justiciable. And now instead of uh, suing under the charter, I simply sued for damages in uh, the breach of uh, Anne and Bill Krem's rights to no taxation without representation. And I've asked for the portion of their taxes that goes to the interest on the debt for the last four budgets since we started this claim as a symbolic damage, uh, you know. So, uh, I, uh, okay. Now, uh, subject to questions, that's all I want to do, talk about the Bank of Canada, but uh, my, my gracious hosts here have asked me to briefly talk about some of my other cases and how they're separate or how do they fit in with the Bank of Canada case. So if, uh, unless I'm, I'm boring you, I'll take five to seven minutes and I can just briefly talk about uh, uh, the bigger picture, uh, if it's okay with you. All right, so we, uh, Machiavelli once said that, you know, the people, the, the people are, most, are, 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 are most enslaved when they declare themselves to be free, right? That's certainly true uh, here in North America. Ever since we got our constitution patriated, although there was a, you know, Quebec got screwed in the back rooms, uh, People have declared themselves to be free through a constitution and people just, you know, they've, they've let down their vigilance and people think they're free here. And it's, it's a delusion. It's a complete delusion. Uh, we talk about constitutional democracy. Uh, and the way constitutional democracy is supposed to work is, you know, parliament makes the laws, the government, the executive enforces the laws, obviously again, you know, they're geared at the citizens and institutions. And the courts, when there's a conflict, are supposed to you know, resolve uh, uh, those disputes. The courts, believe it or not, and this is a pathetic statement uh, uh, for some who don't believe in the courts or lawyers, and there's good reason not to believe in the courts and lawyers, the courts are the only thing we have standing between the government, parliament, and the citizen. So the courts decide two things. One, the relationship between the federal and provincial governments and institutions like the Senate and other ins uh, constitutional institutions, and the state and the citizen. You remove the courts, what you have, on a spectrum of benevolence to genocidal is simply a dictatorship. Yeah. Call it what you want. It's a dictatorship. There's no two ways about it. And one of, the, one of the really unfortunate aspects of recognizing or describing a dictatorship because of recent 20th century history is we have a tendency to confuse and equate a dictatorship with violence and peace with democracy. The United States of America, despite its problems, was probably the most vibrant democracy in the world in the 20th century, but they were almost also the most pathologically, sociologically violent society on the face of the earth. The two have nothing to do with each other. Canada, or places like some of the Nordic countries, were the most peaceful countries in the world, but they're dictatorial. I've been talking about a quiet dictatorship since the Cretan government. For me, it came down with a thump in April 2001 in Quebec City at the summit of the Americas. That was the statement. You fuck off, you live in a dictatorship. Go home or we'll tear gas you, okay? That was it. Uh, there were earlier signs but because the people who were the victims of the action of the government didn't really get much attention. My Vancouver partners and I, mostly my Vancouver partners, I was in the background, uh, defended the, the First Nations at Gufferson Lake. I don't know, who remembers Gufferson Lake? Very few. Lloyd Axworthy and Princess Diana of Wales were touring the world trying to convince the world that we should ban landmines, military landmines. Uh, uh, First Nations in northern BC occupied a piece of land they said was stolen from them. The Canadian Army surrounded them and laced the perimeter with 
the landmines, Princess Diana and Lloyd Axworthy, were trying to ban over Europe at the same frigging time, right? So the dictatorship, and that was all illegal action under the Constitution. Under our Constitution, you cannot dispatch military personnel against a civilian, our civilian population. They did the same thing at Oka. That was illegal, completely illegal, contrary to the Constitution, okay? So that was the beginnings of our, our in-your-face dictatorship. Since the Chrétien government, we have slid into a quiet, uh, you know, polite dictatorship in typical Canadian fashion. You don't see the genocide, you don't see, but it's there. Security certificates, indefinite detention without knowing the evidence against you. What is that? You don't need to, you don't need to put 60,000 people in a concentration camp. All you need to do is put five of them for, for indefinitely as a message to the rest of us. Okay, that's the same phenomenon. And so, and so this, this, is, this has been going on for a bit, and, and unfortunately, during this time, the only thing that has saved us from a complete dictatorship is the courts. Under the Harper government, 44 constitutional cases have gone up to the Supreme Court of Canada. The government has lost 43 of them. Okay? So, in the face of this following news flash, of the nine judges of the Supreme Court of Canada, only one was a liberal appointment. The other one was a Monroney appointment, and the other seven have been Harper appointments. So, his own judges are still. So you understand the perceived depth of this undemocratic government. I am not partisan. I, don't, I, I sued Chrétien governments more times than I have Harper's government. A lot of people misunderstand my cases in terms of personalizing them to me. It's not, I don't care which government it is. It's, it's it, all governments, all, you know, we have political parties that just have different football jersey colors, you know? I mean, there's not much of a spectrum, right? We got, we got, you know, so we got, we got, we, 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 we got, uh, we got uh, orange, we got uh, red, and we have le bleu, not to be confused with Quebecois bleu, but you know, we got the conservatives, so that's it. So it doesn't matter to me which government it is, if they, if they act unconstitutionally, they, they have to be uh, made to account. Uh, Now, the reason I say, unfortunately, the courts are the only, uh, and I'll finish with this, uh, it's because it's not, that, it's not that, that, you know, they don't try hard or they, you know, uh, we shouldn't access them. Certainly, I access them because they need to be accessed. They're not the complete and only and best venue for, uh, for socioeconomic change. As I said before, they're a blunt instrument. They can only do certain things. They can certainly, like in this case, act as an, a, a lightning rod to publicize certain issues that people may not be aware of, uh, but they cannot do what needs to be done on a broader scale. Second of all, cases going to the Supreme Court of Canada are, are extremely expensive. Uh, it's a good thing you're sitting down. The average case Okay, the average case, and my dear client can attest to they're not being charged this, but uh, the average case to go to the Supreme Court of Canada is 1.2 to $2 million from the ground up, okay? Now, there's no way they're paying me that for this, but uh, how many people have that kind of money to go to the Supreme Court, right? The one percent. That's why you see. That's right. That's why. That's why you. <coughs> and so the other cases depend on the goodwill, pro bono services of lawyers if they know how to take the case up. Uh, this is one of the reasons we set up uh, ten years ago in 2004. Uh, I set up. I founded uh, the Constitutional Rights Center. Uh, we worked quietly for ten years. I wanted to work the center on the assumption that we weren't going to get a red penny from anywhere. And so we worked the cases among the small circle of 
uh, uh, colleagues in my office and uh, with me. We did 33 cases in 10 years until before the Constitutional Rights Center came public and it was a co-applicant in the NADON case, is a co-applicant in the Citizenship Challenge, and it will be a co-applicant in the uh, C-51 Challenge. Uh, our website goes up next week. Uh, we're negotiating with a law school to make it a clinic program so we get students for the law school for credit so we can expand their work. Because these cases, given what's happening with the gutting of education, in, in Toronto you're paying about $40,000 a year in tuition in law school. Per year, just for tuition, no books and uh, living expenses. So these kinds of cases are going to be rarer and rarer because law students, if they're if they're inclined to these kinds of cases, they would, be, they would tend to come from people with backgrounds like mine. You know, one of 13 children, only three of us can read and write. I come from a peasant farming family in, it, in southern Italy. I wasn't born here. And I grew up staunch working class. So we have an understanding. Uh, that kind of student, if he or she gets into law school and comes out with $120,000 in debt, it's not going to have the luxury to do the kind of cases I'm doing. And so this is why, you know, uh, the practice of law with this type of case is it's a business. So I, you know, I, I have other activities. I do tax work, which balances and subsidizes these pro bono cases. A lot of lawyers are not willing to do that. They're not willing, you know, to work for Paul so that they can uh, represent uh, Mary for free. So th th this, is, this is how I've balanced the people. You know, people often ask me, well, how can you do these? Well, because, you know, I take from here and then I give over here. Or I'm, you know, I'm smarter with my money or whatever. God has blessed me and that I, I knew when I was, uh, I was in grade eight, I was clinically, clinically uh, diagnosed as being mentally retarded. So they sent me to a trade school, true story. <laughs> True story. True story. And so I went to a trade school and I learned to build a house from the bar, from the foundation up, you know? And so when I came out of law school, I used those talents. To, I made more money at renovating and flipping houses than I did in the practice of law. So not everybody has that kind of luck to be labeled mentally retarded. <laughs> you know? So, you know? So, uh, So we, you know, and I, I, we're not, uh, nobody should mistake this. We're not here to fundraise. We're just saying that if, you, if you're interested in these cases in whatever capacity you want to get involved, lend a hand, you know, I more than welcome it because, uh, and especially from just spreading the word and educating other people about the issues. Uh, it's important, it's important that people take possession of their own society and constitution. The constitution was not made for governments. The constitution is an instrument only people can invoke against the state. The state can't, the state can't say my charter rights are being breached. That's for the citizen. And so you should take ownership. We need, you need to take ownership uh, of, of your own constitution. And with that, I think I'm rambling now. So uh, I, we're happy to take any questions or comments you may have. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. Paul has asked me to just touch on two little things before we take questions. Uh, one is uh, C-51. C-51 was drafted in Berlin in 1936. <laughs> okay? So, so they, just, they just uncovered it. And they, you know, the, and the Harper government translated it into English and French. Just changes the, the place names a bit. It makes a thought... It makes a thought, and a person in London, on, it, it, one of our clients in our office was convicted of this. It's on appeal. It makes what you think an act of terrorism. Yes, right. yes, right. No exaggeration. It's what you think becomes an act of terrorism. Encouraging terrorism is an act of terrorism. I don't have to tell you that you don't have to blow up, be accused of blowing up planes to be charged with terrorism. If you're involved in a logging blockade, a strike that impedes 
essential services. If you're involved in a strike in which an ambulance cannot get through, you ha are guilty of an act of terrorism. Okay? The definition of terrorism in the criminal code is so broad that encompasses, it encompasses legal protest, assembly, and a nonviolent civil disobedience. And now there's the added act of terrorism of encouraging that freedom of expression. It is insane. And so we'll, uh, we obviously plan to challenge it. The other thing I, we, we we're also planning, our next judicial challenge is the gender uh, imbalance in the superior courts of the country. Because in my view, the composition of the superior courts is the only thing that buffers the uh, actions of the state with the citizens. Uh, this government has appointed over 220 or 260 judges. Only 17% were women. Uh, less than 2% were visible minorities. That's just, I call, it in, I call it institutional apartheid. It is just offensive. So our next challenge is a constitutional challenge that would require, you know, not to an exact precision at every hour of the day, but uh, more or less a 50-50 balance between women and men on the, Supreme, uh, on the superior courts. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the other challenge we're gonna be, we're gonna be uh, filing uh, maybe over the summer is that uh, Mr. Hellyer has retained me last year to challenge the constitutional ability to sign economic treaties without putting them through parliament first. So we'll be challenging the CETA, the free trade accord with Europe. Okay, so, all right. Okay, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Porky Pig used to say, that's all folks. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so now uh, we'll take some questions. We've only got the microphone on the one side here. So uh, if you wouldn't mind lining up there for people on the other side, maybe try and maneuver around the back. Um, where possible, I'm going to try and uh, alternate between uh, male and female uh, question askers. <laughs> Et euh, là, encore une fois, n'hésitez pas de poser vos questions en français si vous êtes euh, plus à l'aise à, à les poser en français. Merci. All right. I'll just wait for them, I think, there. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Anne. You've been a tremendously powerful inspiration today. I lost my grandmother about a year ago today, and I must say I will adopt you as a new surrogate grandmother today. You're a very, very inspiring woman for women and, and activists out there. I must tip you my hat. Rocco, you have straightforwardness, you're straight talking. I think we need more of that in politics today. And my question to you, being, being nonpartisan as you are, what's your positioning with the federal election coming? And follow-up question is, have you, because you talked a bit about using cities and municipal governments as proxies, and so do you have any strategies in using possibly the city of Montreal or cities, maybe smaller cities, that would be interested in challenging it with you? Thank you. Well, uh, years ago, uh, years ago, the city of Toronto had passed a motion that the federal government should be seeking interest-free loans from the Bank of Canada to fund municipal infrastructure. Uh, that's all, they passed the motion. Uh, in my conversation with the deputy mayor, who's no longer the deputy mayor uh, of Toronto, who I knew personally for years, we went to the same high school. When we launched the, 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 the uh, case, we, we, we asked if the city of Toronto would be interested but at that time, the mayor was uh, David Miller, and they were in negotiation, if you remember, for federal infrastructure. And the typical Canadian response was, oh, well, we think we can, uh, you know, uh, we'd like to attract uh, more flies with honey than vinegar. Uh, I never understood that expression, because I, I never want to attract flies. If I want to kill them, I just swat them, you know? But anyway, don't waste the honey or the vinegar. But, but so they were very apprehensive about going to court on our side because, because uh, they didn't want to derail what they thought were fruitful talks with the feds. There is a counselor who, again, is a, 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 I've known for years, uh, Christian Tam Wong, who's been leading the forefront to convince people 
to actually establish a city bank. City of Toronto and City of Montreal in the old days, before the Bank of Canada, had their own banks. Now think about that, how, how innovative that would be for the city to set up its own banks with its, its, its residents as the depositors, right? Of course, nobody likes that idea, especially the other banks. Uh, so past that, no, I, I, fear, I fear that what will happen, as I said, uh, the parties don't see themselves as just different colored jersey, football jerseys, so I think there's a real danger that the present government may come up the middle if there's no strategic voting, right? In the last election, on the 14 ridings that swung the election, the difference in votes was only 6,000 on 14 ridings combined. So, you know, that's pretty precarious uh, 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 democracy. Uh, we don't have proportional representation, and most people don't realize that our Constitution doesn't allow for it unless we have a constitutional amendment, because the writings first at the poll are actually named in the Constitution. So we could never simply have proportional representation by statute alone. It would require the consent of all ten provinces to do that. Anyway. Hello? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'm actually the Deputy Chief of the Green Party of Quebec, so hi, <laughs> everybody. Thank you for attending. I'm actually uh, very happy that a few of you guys came. Um, the subject is so important, and I've been following um, your, your association since 2012. Um, I'm very impressed about what you added. Um, I've written to the Bank of Canada. I've been answered by interns, because like, that's what they do, <laughs> basically. And uh, mostly what they've said is that um, basically that it would create inflation if we would create our own money and that government and uh, money spender has to be uh, differentiated because it could create whatever, whatever. Uh, but basically my question is, can you give us more, in because they, they keep answering me about interest bearing government bonds. Um, which I believe, if in my understanding, is um, when we sell our debt to other countries. And it's very difficult to find information. When I do my research for my political party, it's very difficult for me to find actual... Um, I find stuff, but it's, it's sent me directly to bank accounts or numbers, and it's very difficult. Can you give us more information on who is actually owning our debt in, so we can be able to kind of explain and try to give more than an idea because when we speak with the public we're all interested in the subject when when you speak with a new person that doesn't really understand the concept of banking uh, so i would like to have more information on that if you right. well, well part of the debt is created by the bank issuing bonds in the name of the government so the government owes the interest back to the bank of canada that's not a problem the other money we don't know where it goes we don't know which banks are lending it they don't tell us under the Bank of Canada Act, they, have, they set up accounts at the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, and all the other bankers, and those institutions have accounts in our Bank of Canada. So when we get money and pay it back, it goes through those, but nobody's going to show you those bank accounts. They're not public. And that's what, part of the challenge that we have is we say we are entitled to know those numbers and who's getting our money. That's part of the challenge. But we don't know. You can't get it. Yet. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. Before we continue, I'd like to recognize that is, as is often the case, we have a bunch of guys in line, and I'm sure they have some great questions, but I would encourage any women or people who identify as women to uh, come down and ask some questions. <laughs> Bonjour, donc merci beaucoup pour la conférence, c'était très intéressant. Euh, par contre, j'aimerais euh, que vous euh, juste peut-être réexpliquer euh, rapidement euh, tout le, pas tout le budget du processus, mais plutôt euh, en quoi est-ce que euh, l'anticipation du budget par rapport à la, à la création de la dette ou enfin cette partie qui est, euh, que vous avez parlé, euh, j'aimerais que vous l'expliquiez juste euh, revenir peut-être rapidement en franglais si vous pouvez euh, parce que je trouve que c'est ça en ce moment avec l'austérité tout le débat je pense qu'il faudrait euh, euh, pas, je pense que j'ai un peu mal maîtrisé le concept et je pense aussi qu'il y a des gens aussi dans la salle donc voilà okay, par exemple chaque, 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 translate that real fast. Okay. Uh, the question was with, uh, he thanked you for being here first of all, and uh, then the question was with regards to the budget and what you touched upon regarding uh, how the budget is presented to MPs uh, 
with the story with the tax credit and as well the fact that uh, the, the, the amount that the uh, interest payments take up in the budget. Okay. Uh, par exemple, chaque année, uh, quand le, le budget uh, est, est publié, le gouvernement dit, OK, uh, on va avoir uh, 280 dollars de déplin, on va avoir 240 uh, 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 billions de, de, de dollars de revenus, donc on a besoin d'emprunter 40 billions de dollars comme déficit. La deuxième, la, 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 la deuxi le deuxième chiffre, ce n'est pas vrai. Le revenu, c'est plus que 240 billions. Ça peut être 350, 400 billions, mais ils calculent les 240 billions après déduire les, les crédits de taxes d'impôt euh, aux individus, aux corporations et tout ça. Donc, euh, ça, c'est lié au déficit, dans le sens que ce n'est pas tout, tout à fait clair ni nécessaire d'avoir un déficit. On peut, on peut réduire les crédits qu'on qu donne aux, aux Canadiens, aux corporations, aux, aux, au Canada chaque année. Par exemple, si on a un revenu de 350 billions, euh, au lieu de donner 90 billions en crédit, on donne 50 billions en crédit. Et on n'aura pas de dette ou de déficit pour cette année. Je ne sais pas si je me suis... À, 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 si ça c'est compréhensible pour en français ou non. OK. OK. Hello. Uh, I have uh, three little questions. Thank you very much for you both, for your lectures. Very, very very good for this taboo subject. Uh, you know, I saw Khmer on my computer, uh, the result of your in court, and uh, you said that the newspaper didn't have the right to write about it. So I called the Devoir in Montreal, I said that you said that, and the person said, no, uh, nobody told us uh, we can write. But how can they tell them not to do it? Do they receive a phone call from, you know, Mr. Harper? How many individuals do you think control the press in Canada, the mainstream press? How many individuals? Take a guess, wild guess. Ten. Five. <laughs> Five, including cabinet that controls the CBC. Most people here don't know that the CBC is controlled by cabinet. Cabinet can give a secret order and tell the CBC what to do or not to do, and they can't even publicize the without an order. Okay? So... Now, Le Devoir was also sent press releases when we went to court. Listen, I've heard this from so many people, from old journalists. I can't reveal their names because they've asked me not to. Journalists that I've known for 15 years, I give them the story, they call back and say, we can't co I can't cover it. People who pretend, oh, I cover what I want, they do an interview. CBC has done interviews. The interview never sees the light of day. The only time this got mainstream media was by the Toronto Star, the Ottawa Bureau, because if it was Toronto, they wouldn't, because the Toronto financial reporter had this material for six months. He didn't touch it, okay? He did, refused to touch it. It, was on a, it, was, it must have been a slow news day on a Friday. The Bureau in Ottawa wrote this, and it just slipped through. And they only wrote about it because the Epic Times, I don't know if you're familiar with the Epic Times newspaper, it's a paper that basically was set up by the Falun Gong movement. It publishes in over 60 cities all over the world, and they put the story on the front page. And the mainstream media always, always canvasses the Epoch Times because they're independent, they're, they're independent as a media. And so it was only when he caught that story on the front page that the Toronto Star reporter, and then I got other calls, but the Globe and Mail still hasn't written a story. They were interested. They have all the material. The CBC got all the material. They've all had the material. They can posture all they want. The question, the question you need to ask Le Devoir, well, you know, the, you have the material now. You don't think this is important enough to write a story now? They, they haven't called me. Yeah. And Le Devoir has covered all my cases, by the way. Okay. okay? <laughs> And uh, about the big, the big picture, is the Trans-Pacific Treaty uh, there? You know, and also, what do you think about an OD audit on the debt? 
A E U D I T. Oh, okay. Je m'ai compris. La deuxième question, c'était quoi? An audit. An audit? Yeah, in front. Yeah. Uh, is is this a good idea to do? I I don't know what that, the the audit. It's. It, uh, I've, I've been asked this question before. It's a very complex question, and it's tied to this idea of odious debt and toxic debt. It's a very complex question because the notion of toxic debt or, uh, or odious debt is tied to the statutory regimes under which the money is taxed. So if they tax money for hospitals, you, know, you, you would have to track all the budgetary expenditures. Uh, I see the notion of odious or toxic debt as another way of saying fraudulent expenditure. Okay, and unless you can s s show it's fraud, then there, the, the, I don't think there's any benefit. What we need to, do, what people need to do and understand is that, simply put, the entire system of bypassing the Bank of Canada mechanism, which we have, and and oh, here's the other irony that we didn't touch upon: the private banks get their money from central banks. During the bank collapse, they were getting their money from the Federal Reserve at 0% interest, from our bank at one quarter of 1% interest, and they didn't say that was inflationary. And then they take the same money and they lend it back to our government at 3.5%. That, to me, is a fraud on the Canadian people. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? And so, so I, see, I see no need to audit each item to see which is odious. The whole system that they have forced us uh, uh, to, to adhere to and the system that allows foreign private bankers to control our fiscal policy and our public central bank is all we need to know and attack. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that I think that both of you guys are heroes. Yes. <laughs> um, And uh, I'd just like to uh, get your take on uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, it, 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 it falls into the same illegal, unconstitutional uh, uh, actions that we're going to be challenging using the CETA and the NAFTA court. I litigated this issue in 1997 uh, under the uh, Multilateral Agreement on Investment. And also, that was the issue in Quebec City under the FTAA. And under the MAI, which was a, an anticipated mother load of the treaties of treaties with the 27 OECD countries, they moved to strike the, ca the, the case. My, our, basic pro our basic position is this. The federal government cannot sign a treaty in which they sign and bind exclusive provincial and First Nation rights, right, vis-a-vis -vis other countries that they can't implement in Canada, but then have to compensate foreign countries and companies when they can't do business under the treaty. It puts the treaty above Canadian sovereignty. It puts the treaty above the Constitution, private interest over the Constitution. That's what's wrong with it. And in order to do that, they would have to first pass it through Parliament, and second, get consent from the provinces on issues of provincial jurisdiction. They don't do that. When, uh, but they sign the treaties on what they say is purported crown prerogative. Before we patriated the Constitution, the Queen or the Governor General signed the treaties on crown prerogative. It's my view that once we patriated the Constitution, there is no crown prerogative left in the executive. Okay, everything is covered by the constitution or statute. And so that, that, that regime or scheme with Ch and the treaties with China are just as illegal as the one with Europe. Yeah. Thank you. My point of view on free trade deals is that they are treasonous acts. They are acts that were taken behind my back and they are acts that are unbelievable. What government would sign anything that would dictate that they couldn't pass a law to save the environment that might bite into the money profit of some corporation? And my position is this. I do not feel bound by such treaties at all. I feel no 
honor bound to that treaty at all. I want those people to be, in fact, paid for what I see as a crime. Just so, just so that... Uh, under the NAFTA, for instance, we have paid over $3 billion in compensation to companies who want to exercise their right under the treaty but can't because it's, it touches provincial jurisdiction or First Nation rights. In Quebec, yeah, so we, we've, we pay billions of dollars. My personal theory is that this is just money going between friends in different countries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. With a degree in political science and being a CPA, I was a little pissed to find out that most of my education didn't teach me anything about money at some point in my life. Um, when I started summing up the total debt of Western nations, I came to about 145 trillion, and I stopped counting there. And as an accountant, I was asking myself, well, normally when you get interest on something, you have to have that asset to charge interest. And if not, it's a fraud, and a human being should be able to be targeted with that fraud. So right now, you're going against the Bank of Canada, but is there any way, because it's obviously a conspiracy, to charge individuals like the Minister of Finance with uh, basically fraud and conspiracy? Because we're paying for uh, interest on a debt where those issuing the debt never had the assets. That's my understanding. Right. So is there any way to make it criminal and go after people? Because people tend to wake up and pay attention when it's their head on the block. Thank you. Uh, you you never be able to prove the one of the two essential element, elements of a criminal offense. And the first one is what we call the actus reus, the act, and the two is the intention. I don't think more, you know, the really astute ones know there's something wrong, but I don't think most of your politicians, including finance ministers, have actually been properly educated. They just, they just buy, you know, oh, we have five Nobel Prize winners uh, in economics from the Chicago uh, University. They're telling us this is good and all of that, but a lot of that's been debunked. So they're just following the herd in terms of, and, and they're just parrots, parroting, you know, the dogma, right, without actually analyzing it. I can sympathize with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Hi, I just wanted to thank both of you very much. This has been a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon, even if it's really sunny outside. <laughs> it's been really interesting. Uh, I had a quick question about the, uh, specifically the uh, other substantive arguments uh, that the government might make. So inflation's one, but are there others? No, they, they, they're, banking, they're banking on this idea that these are not issues for the courts, the so-called justiciability. And if they are issues for the courts, the court has no jurisdiction over this. And if they do have jurisdiction, these people should not be the ones presenting this, maybe a government or a First Nations group, so they don't have standing. It's, if, I can, if I can just detract a little bit, years ago, you know, the government lawyers were not act this way. They would simply plead the case and had it, have it determined. Historically, constitutional law in this country has been about nothing but socioeconomic issues and uh, division of power between the provinces and the feds. So before the charter came in, you know, gov uh, cases at the Supreme Court were deciding what's margarine? Who gets to determine the ingredients of margarine? How many truckfuls of margarine can you cross the Quebec border with and all? Beer. I stopped drinking Canadian beer when in my first year of constitutional law, I, under I, I realized it was 116 preservatives. I couldn't believe it, right? So. Wage and price controls in 1976 with Trudeau. The Supreme Court weighed in. So when the charter came in, people assumed we, we shouldn't be meddling in the socioeconomic rights, you know, which, which, which is silly. And apart from that, the legit, litigious society of the United States has creeped up here. Uh, we had, when I was in law school, the uh, federal court judge from the States came, and he gave a very funny example, which is true. Uh, you know, he said, in the old days, if your, cat, if, your, if your neighbor's goat ate your cabbage, he'd come over, apologize, and say, hi, hey, Bill, what do you want, how much do you want for that cabbage? Today, that person would have to sue the, uh, the, the goat owner, the neighbor, and the statement of defense would read something like this. I'm not your neighbor. If I am your neighbor, I don't have a goat. If I have a goat, you don't have cabbages. If you have cabbages, they were not eaten by my goat. If my oak goat did eat your cabbage, it was insane at the time. 
And so this is what you're seeing with this case, you know? It's not justiciable. If it is justiciable, there's no jurisdiction. If there is jurisdiction, there's no standing. If there is standing, nobody likes your clients. And since one of them is 101, let's just wait this out. <laughs> you know, Bill Cram is 101 this year. So you don't think it'll even get to substantive arguments? No, or? no, we will. What I'm saying is that they haven't revealed the substantive arguments. The only arguments they've made so far are phony, bullshit, procedural, and vague arguments like, you know, don't look at this, please, because we appointed you. You're dumb federal appointee judges anyway, so throw this out. I mean, that's the cynical, that's what they're thinking. If they can just get a judge to throw it out, they don't have to deal with it. You know? There is no substantive argument to these issues. Well, I mean, on the, the other question I have is sort of, if they're elected, aren't they allowed to decide things and be wrong, no. make bad decisions? Yeah, they can, as long as it doesn't breach constitutional uh, requirements. You know? Thank yeah, you. Okay. Well, like others, I will uh, thank you for uh, certainly the most uh, animated and entertaining discussion of uh, monetary matters uh, I've ever heard, and I've heard a few. Um, but I'm certainly not in a position to comment on the legal side of the situation, although given your track record, I'd certainly bet on you over Mr. Harper. Um, but two, two issues. It seems to me in the, in the basic idea about the role of the Bank of Canada versus private banks, um, there's kind of whiff of social credit in there uh, is the first thing. The second thing is I'm old enough to have been around in the 50s and 60s when the Bank of Canada was doing what you're arguing it should be doing. And that wasn't particularly a picnic period, right? That was the Cold War. Um, that was, in a sense, the creation of the national security state, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me that in the focus on the question of the bank, there's a substitution of a technical issue for a political one, which is basically who controls the state and to what end. Um, when the government in the, in the 40s and the 50s was borrowing all that money, they were spending it on World War II and the Cold War, um, about which there was a very wide political consensus on the part of the capitalist leaders of the country. They could, it could be argued, they could just as easily have spent it to eliminate child poverty, but there was no such consensus among capitalist leaders. So supposing you win your court case, um, and we go back to the way it was in the 50s and 60s, but Harper remains prime minister, it seems to me that nothing of substance would change. Um, and that, that, I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to pursue the court case. It's just I don't see pursuing and winning the court case getting us anywhere by us, I mean progressive people, anywhere unless there's a significant change um, in the people who run the government and their priorities. And that's a whole different issue. Uh, that's partly true, but it's, um, your first comment was, uh, uh, is not unimportant. I, I'm not, I don't, you know, I have my own ideas. Like, I'll confess to everybody here, I'm, I'm a proud anarchist. I don't buy, I don't, I don't buy the liberal, I, I don't, I don't, I don't buy the neoliberal system at all, so I don't really care. But as a lawyer, I, that's not my concern. For, for me as a lawyer representing my clients, it, the, 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 the only issue is adhering to the Bank of Canada Act, which has not been changed since 1938, and when you interpret a statute, you have to go to its historical purposes, why it's there. Second of all, if they're not adhering to the act and are not exercising its provisions, does that lead to a constitutional breach? And in this case, it leads to several. So if they're successful, I beg to differ, because the next time somebody asks for interest-free money from the Bank of Canada, the government says no, you can challenge that on a reasonable standard. So, whether the government likes it or not. So, I don't... Now, the second thing is, I, I'm often asked the question, why doesn't the government simply remove the ability to give in, uh, the, change the Bank of Canada Act and just get away, it, just resolve this problem by simple legislation, which they could. And that goes to your, the legitimacy of your observation that, you know, they're the government of the day, they get voted in, and so if their policy is never any interest-free loans again, just change the act, but they haven't done that. 
So what they're doing is they're subverting the statute and the Constitution by simply pretending that the law is not there. There are two reasons why the government doesn't change the act. The minor reason is that it would have to be debated and then Canadians would actually know something they didn't know nationwide. And they, that might create something the government couldn't control and a demand that we go back to, to, to at least a balance of what the bank was created for. But the big, the, I, my belief is that the bigger reason, the, the more major reason they don't take, take that provision out is this government, you know, they're not stupid. They know if the international banking system does collapse, they're going to be, they're, you see how fast they'll revert to original purpose of the Bank of Canada and start printing interest-free money to get us back. Because we're the only country who can do it legally. And it's very easy to remove a provision from a statute, very hard to pass one if you don't have a, 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 an absolute majority. Now, the state of the, North Dakota since 1905 has had a public bank that lends all its money interest-free to the government. Since 1905, the state of North Dakota has never had a single deficit. Six weeks ago or seven weeks ago, Iceland just, passed, just created their public bank and they're requiring private banks could not lend unless, except on 100% reserve. They can only lend what they have. Lastly, the, what people have to remember, the substantive arguments of the government are nonsense because before the Bank of Canada was created in 1938, guess who printed all the currency in Canada? The private banks. It was like Canadian tire money. CIBC Bank had its dollars, the, the other banks had their dollars. Nobody ever complained about that system, and they printed as many of them as they wanted without control. So. Um, I, I, you raise a really important point, and it has to do with what Einstein said. One of the things, I've been thinking about the characteristics of a better, a higher level of thinking. And one of the characteristics of that is that we have to be more aware of the complexity of things, of the interconnectedness of things. We can't just change one thing. We have to change many things. And, uh, uh, a, a num this is really happening too. There's a much, a much greater recognition of the need for this, um, and so we have people from different disciplines becoming interested in <coughs> economics, making the, uh, the the connection between economics and recognizing that they have to understand something about economics to really appreciate the truth. So you've got the anthropologist like uh, David Graeber, um, the climatologist in Australia, Tim Flannery, he's written a book called uh, Here on Earth. And in that book, he talks about a fundamental tenet of uh, neoliberal economics, summed up in uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, comment, there's no such thing as society. And he says, that this idea is a very warped and incorrect interpretation of Darwin. And then he says, and how neatly he puts it, he says, either these ideas will prevail or we will. Euh, merci beaucoup pour euh, votre présence, votre inter votre, euh, pr vos présentations. Je pense que vous faites un travail qui est, qui est important et qu'il faut continuer. Je vous souhaite euh, tout le succès dans, dans vos, euh, vos projets futurs et dans la suite des choses. Euh, D'autres ont, ont posé des questions de fond. Euh, moi, je vais m'en tenir à un niveau peut-être un peu plus concret. Je, je voulais savoir par rapport à la, à la poursuite au, euh, à la Cour suprême, maintenant que depuis la, le jugement du 25 janvier, est-ce qu'il y a des choses qui se sont passées? Est-ce qu euh, est que vous avez euh, rédigé une nouvelle déclaration? Et pour les mois qui viennent, à quoi est-ce qu'on peut s'attendre en termes de procédures et de développement là, dans ce dossier-là? 
fast. Uh, he thanked you, of course, for your presence and all your work today. Uh, and uh, basically, he's interested what news there's been on the legal front since uh, 25th January and what we can expect from there. Well, I filed the amended statement of claim uh, in March. Uh, they're supposed to respond today, but I, I had brief discussions with the lawyer of justice. They're considering another abusive motion to strike, and so I'm going to canvass with my clients. If they do that, I may go to the Supreme Court from the last level court and have to ask the Supreme Court to just order the, the claim to proceed. I don't, we don't want to waste our time with another round of motions to strike. That's what's happening with it right now. Monsieur Galetti, merci beaucoup. Merci pour votre courage, pour votre honnêteté, pour votre intégrité. C'est une denrée un peu rare aujourd'hui dans ce monde. I think you understood. Uh, I've been running for Canadian Action Party. I was the only one in Quebec last election. I was running in uh, the writing of uh, Christian Paradis. I am not sure he's living in a paradise. <laughs> But uh, um, <coughs> la vie m'a amené à, à, à m'intéresser à cette réalité-là par hasard, s'il existe. Et um, je me suis retiré deux semaines à la, avant la fin du vote pour euh, céder le, la place euh, pour essayer de battre... Euh, Christian Paradis, parce que ce n'était pas mes intérêts personnels, mais c'était l'intérêt du, du Québec et de la nation. Euh, C'est sûr que si on veut changer ces états de fait-là, seul, individuellement, we can't. We have to get together. And, and, and j'ai initié, I initiated a project called l'Assemblée constituante provisoire du Québec, which we tried to get people together so that we, um, we uh, make a lot of pressure on every candidate at the next election so that they um, s'engage solennellement to convoke uh, uh, an assembly constituant citoyenne non partisan so that we people write down our own constitution at least in Quebec for to start, so that will be a beginning. Because if we don't get together, I don't see how we're going to be able to change all these facts. The, uh, la réforme du mode de scrutin, uh, Lévesque tried to do it, tried to did it, to do it, sorry. Uh, but he, he, he s'est fait couillonner by his own ministers that when, they, when people get into power, they forget why they are serving people. And, and so if we want to change it, we have to write it down ourselves because we live, we're, we're not, Quebec is recognized as a nation now. Uh, if we write down our own, own constitution and we ask people to, to approve it, then the, the, the ultimate power will be us, the people. So. Are you, I know the, the six nations in Ontario are doing the same thing. Are you affiliated with them? Uh, I, I, we have discussions, but yeah. uh, I'm working right now only... Uh, I see. Because, uh, and their constitution is not restricted to First Nations. It's all Canadians, but they are taking the initiative to say, we, 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 we have to redraft what we think a citizen's uh, a constitution that, uh, that serves us rather than the uh, interests. There's certainly an emergency. Yeah. And, and we're trying to do it in Quebec first, and, yeah. and, and then we'll see if we can manage to, uh, right. to build a real, real federation right. with uh, five or seven right. sovereign uh, right. entities. Right. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Hi, and uh, once again, thanks you, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, teaching all of, uh, all of us uh, about this. Uh, some of us do know uh, bits and facts about it, but uh, my question is, right now, Canadian banks, um, on $100, how many times can they lend that $100 again? And on that answer br brings the other question, um, what are the provisions 
of banks right now? Uh, the answer to your question is it's as high as 20. 20 times over, they can land that. Woo! <laughs> yeah, so I mean, listen, if Joe Bonanno and the crime families did that in New York, they'd be in prison, right? Extortion, right? yeah. <laughs> it's a pyramid scheme. It's a fraudulent pyramid scheme. Huh? Ponzi. Yes. Ponzi scheme. I don't like the word Ponzi scheme because it's, a, it's racially charged. Mr. Ponzi was the most <laughs> small, insignificant of criminals. These are real pyramid schemes. I, I worked on the first pyramid scheme when I was a Department of Justice lawyer and we got a million dollar fine. These are pyramid schemes. Huge, huge. That's right. So it's up to 20 times and they only have to keep two of your dollars in the, in the vault. So that means only 2%. That's right, so 2 that cents on the dollar, yeah. All those billions they've been making these past years, yeah. yeah. on average, each bank makes like 3 billion every three months, yeah. every trimester. Yeah. Only 2% of that is actually real yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier also that uh, Canada is the only country with a public uh, central bank. How many countries in the world are not uh, entitled like to the uh, Fonds Monétaire International, the, the, the International Monetary Fund? I've heard China, Cuba, there might be two or three yeah, countries. Yeah, they're the ones who... yeah, and that's because they have public central banks. I was saying Canada is the only country in the G8, you know, the industrialized country who don't have a central bank. China has a central bank. Cuba has a central bank. So the IMF won't deal with them because they know they have independent banking policy. And China is the country to look at. They're not giving away their central bank. They refuse to shut it down. And they know what's going on. Thank you. Merci pour la conférence. Ma question, c'est n'est pas vraiment une question, je voulais plus savoir si j'avais bien compris. Dans le fond, dans la Constitution, il n'y aurait pas eu de modification, par exemple, au moment du rapatriement, si ça aurait été possible d'en faire au moment du rapatriement. Puis, ni dans la loi sur les banques, il n'y aurait pas de rien qui, qui, qui justifierait le changement de rôle de la Banque du Canada euh, des années 70. Sinon, ce que je vois, ce serait peut-être plus la, euh, un prétexte là, au moment de l'effondrement du système de Bretton Woods. Puis, il y a eu de la montée de l'idéologie néolibérale. C'est plus une, comme ça que je le vois. Là. Je ne sais pas si c'est un peu le portrait de la situation là, que vous aviez expliqué au début. Là. that he understood correctly uh, that within the uh, Bank Act and within the Constitution there uh, was nothing that actually forced this change over in 1974 or, or continues to maintain that and I if I understood he wants to know what it has to do with the collapse of Bretton Woods uh, well on the first question the law hasn't changed they simply refuse la, la loi n'a pas changé Le gouvernement refuse de l'appliquer. Okay? Il n'y a rien dans le statut, il n'y a rien dans la constitu constitution qui empêche le gouvernement de uh, demander des, des emprunts sans intérêt de la banque. La loi, c'est la même que c'était en 1938. Okay. And, uh, the other part of the question was what? Sorry about Bretton Woods. Ben, je me disais si, dans le fond, si ce changement de rôle-là, de rôle-là de la banque, ça n'avait pas été comme dans le courant de tout ce qui s'est passé là avec l'effondrement du système de Bretton Woods, puis tu sais la montée de l'idéologie néolibérale. Well, it's 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 the 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 banking system you're seeing now, which is in your face, it, it just goes hand in glove with that whole post Bretton Woods uh, meeting on globalization. Basically, globalization has been a very meticulously planned, uh, people think it just happened all of a sudden. But you know, globalization started with the European uh, common market. They, they, were gonna do a tr they were gonna do a trade zone in North America, but because we were so independent compared to Europe, 
they said you can't do it. So we, the way they sold it to North America was industry by industry, so that we had the auto pact first, and so they slowly introduced it here until we finally got NAFTA. But this, this, this control that you see from the banks just goes hand in hand with the globalization and agenda to bypass sovereign nations and their constitutions and have a ruling order that nobody can touch. Hi. Hi. This is my first time in such a conference. And, Mine um, too. You too? <laughs> That's great. Okay. So I was just having a conversation with a friend yesterday, and she studies in uh, political sciences, and she was explaining to me that we are now living in a debt economy. And I found that profoundly contradictory. How can a debt be economical? So can you, can you please uh, resume that for me? How would you resume that in a concise way for me too. Well, a debt, a debt is, it's only economic if you mutually consent to it being economic, okay? So here's, like most people think they know what money is, they confuse money with currency. So money, the way I, I define money in one word, is money is a mutually consensual means by which to exchange and pay for labor, goods, and services, and credit for extinguishing debt. Now, I'll leave aside interest on money for a second. That's the, what confuses and controls the world. But, you know, when Germany after the war, you know Germany now is complaining that us lazy Italians, Greeks, and Spaniards are bringing the European system down. No country has had more subsidy to their f banking system in actual amounts or per capita than Germany. All the war debt that Germany had after the Second World War, when the European Union was established, was just wiped out. They said, okay, that's it, you don't owe us anything. And then Germany said, oh, that's good. So they didn't know anything. It didn't change any subway. It didn't change the food on, in the supermarkets. It's just a consensual, it's a consensual, uh, it's a consensual act. I don't want to be graphic, okay? I don't want to be graphic, but if you think about it in these terms, okay? Sex between two consenting adults is the most marvelous thing in the world. When one doesn't consent, it's the most vicious, horrific act. It's the same physical act. The only thing that changes is the mental consent. Right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's banking and that's debt. But who does it profit? It only profits to the bank. That's right, they're raping us. Okay. Because we don't consent. No, uh, <laughs> okay. 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 Hi. Hi. I have some comments, but I will ask my question first. Okay. Do you have a kind of plan of, um, it's weird, Diego. <laughs> you have a kind of plan for like lobbying or teaching to the MPs in all Canada or? No. <laughs> Be because. Uh, maybe they do, and not me. <laughs> because somehow uh, we need to bring credibility to them and say, okay. look, maybe you don't know, and then we need to be above like stories, like conspiracy. We need to show that that's the fact. So do you have any strategy on that? Look, uh, you go on YouTube, somebody asked Justin Trudeau, what do you think of the Bank of Canada case in the Bank of Canada? He turned and said, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I'm sure he knows nothing about the case. He knows nothing about the economics, knows nothing. Uh, Tom Mulclair was asked about this issue. And he just turned and said, well, if that's what you want, you'll have to seek another party. I'm sure he didn't know what the person was talking about. So there's, you know, politicians are out there to get vote and power. So often they're too embarrassed to engage because they know they may be over their head. Nobody's asking to be educated. And when you try, they avoid you. And so that's a very, Paul Hellyer says, this is a big problem. And it is a big problem. The only thing, you can do, I'm not going to go try to, the only way I can try to educate them is through court action, right? Uh, like all the other cases I do. But people can force them to get educated by raising it when they come to the door during election time, calling them, 
calling their, uh, their candidates in their writing and say, what do you know about the Bank of Canada case? What do you know about the Bank of Canada? What do you know about our debt financing? And if they say nothing, they said, well, why don't you learn? It's an issue to me. It's an, it's an issue to the whole country. So we need to, to be like informed of the sure. active cases sure. and say, look, there's yeah. something. We need to take them, yeah. them like by the hand, yeah. like yeah. a child. That's well. And here, like today, right. read it. It's for me. You're doing that. Right. That. Well, and they often uh, they do that with other cases. You know, do you think they're experts on the environment? No. They're experts on nuclear energy. No. But if there's an issue in nuclear energy, somebody has to educate them. And if nuclear energy is important to you and you don't want it in your back door, you're sure, sure as hell going to scream about it. You're not a nuclear scientist and neither is the MP. But you've got to engage. You don't want that nuclear reactor in your back door. Anyway, all the other comments, maybe I could send it in the network someday. But I just want to say one thing is that you can go on YouTube. There's a series called Star Wars Legacy. And they quote somebody at the end, maybe Margaret Mead, I don't, I don't remember. It says, uh, don't believe that a little group can change things because, in fact, it's the only way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that score, you know, people have, no I people have no problem believing one virus can cause a pandemic and kill everybody, but they have a hard time believing that a good idea can travel like a pandemic. Well, I don't know why that is. So I think you, as I said, I have many things mm -hmm. I, I could send it so, because uh, there's many things that I, I, I understand like for years and, and uh, it would change things if people know them. L like how, how well, if I can give one like uh, the, uh, when we print uh, the, the limit of printing money, we can say, let's say that it's inflation. But uh, the first source of inflation is how many times banks are putting money on the market yeah. and at the end the government cannot do it anymore for their own use because inflation is already there and because of that these loans they need to use the bank in order or oh, give me the money I could get by myself so uh, and because of inflation our money is getting lower lower in its value so it's like if they are taking look at they are doing that they are stealing our own money. The, the number does not change, but the, the power of purchasing is changing. So uh, I think it's a problem. When they say they made, uh, I don't know how many millions in one year, they did it with the system, and the system is taking value from our wallet. Yeah. See, they, they don't have a problem with inflation when they create the inflation. They have a problem with inflation if we create it for the people's needs, okay? And even if inflation were created, let's forget it. So what? Do you throw the, the, the baby out with the bathwater? Let's say you spend $1,000 on hospitals and you've caused an inflation of $12. You still spent $88 on, on hospitals. It's still, you know, it's like, you know, in my center, right, we, my constitutional rights center, people call me and they say, oh, you don't have a charitable status. I say, yeah, no, we're not connected to government in any way. I don't apply for charity status. Oh, but then that means I can't deduct it. So it's hard for me to contribute. I said, well, look, if you were going to give $100, and with the tax benefit of the charitable deduction, what would you be out of your pocket? Oh, in my tax bracket, $60. I said, send me the $60. I'm still OK with that. <laughs> you understand? But, but uh, I suppose the government, government could print more money they if should. they would have the, 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 be the only one with that power. Yeah, they're the only one with that power in Canada. That's what a central bank, nobody else can print money now, only the Bank of Canada, but they only choose to print it for the private banks. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, not, not anymore, I think, but like last year, even last year, at the TD Bank on Corners Guy and St. Catherine, there was a big picture of the, the bills they were printing in the, I don't know what year. In the 20s, probably, in 30s. Yeah, 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 yeah printed yeah. by, uh, remitted, I don't know what the yeah. verb was. And, and so you, we saw that yeah. bank were uh, creating money at that time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> first of all, yeah. For, first of all, um, a lot of it is in the bookkeeping. There are a lot of problems with the way the books are kept. Um, for example, if you're going to consider money spent on educating the young 
as an expense, that's one thing. If you're going to recognize it as what it really is, which is the best investment that a society can make, that's quite another thing. There are all kinds of problems with the bookkeeping. And um, uh, the other thing is that mere price rise, and, and, uh, and Rocco was, was alluding to this, mere price rise is not necessarily inflation. If you, for example, uh, consider the difference between uh, the, the, the medical help that can be given and, um, and, and the services that can be improved and can save lives where we lost them all before because of technologies that are, yes, expensive, like MRIs or whatever. Um, if, if you consider that in a mixed economy just to be uh, an expense, that's, you can call that inflation, but that's not, that should not be considered. So how we count is a big, big problem as well. And getting back to uh, the idea of uh, educating the MPs, been there, done that. For years, Comer has, uh, has uh, presented uh, papers to commissions, uh, lobbied, uh, done all kinds of things. Every two months we publish a journal and every MP gets a copy of that. There's something to be said for Christ's advice. Let him who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Don't waste your breath. You have to do what you can, but the best thing to do, it's again a higher level of thinking. Rescue is not going to come from the top down under present circumstances. We have to elect a whole different kind of person to political office. The party system has to go. Electoral change is essential. And what one of the things we should be doing is to see that between now and the next federal election, we work together to present an ultimatum. If you don't commit to electoral change, to electoral reform, we will not vote for you, candidate by candidate. Uh, just before we continue, uh, we are supposed to uh, end this at 6 o'clock, and now the Gardas are getting a little nervous and thinking we might try and occupy the place again, so we wouldn't want to give them that impression. So I'm just going to ask our, our last uh, two uh, interventional, go ahead, it's fine, but uh, we're going to cut it off after that. And just before you go, because there's a lot of people that are walking up, I just want to put some information there. That's some information that I mentioned at the beginning of the, in, uh, e, uh, of the conference, uh, ways you can get involved or contribute and, uh, and other stuff. So go ahead, thanks. Yes, thank you both for your interventions. Um, they were both very informative and inspiring. And I'm interested in finding out a little bit more about the relationship between the Bank of Canada, Parliament, um, and Cabinet. Um, and who exactly determines, or who is responsible for determining the monetary policy that is implemented through the Bank of Canada? Is it the governor of the Bank of Canada? Is it the Minister of Finance? And just um, as a piece of information to add to that list, of countries that you mentioned have a, cent a public central bank. Uh, there's Argentina, and I think it's a very interesting case study, not only because I'm, uh, I've been studying it for a really long time, but because uh, when the people of Argentina recently elected a government that was actually willing to stand up for the public central bank and against uh, vulture funds, well, we kind of all saw what happened, so. Uh, under the Bank of Canada, the governor uh, determines policies, now he's, the governor has been taking marching orders from this foreign bank, uh, Bank of International Settlements. The Minister of Finance can, uh, the, the, the Minister of Finance, with the approval of Cabinet, can give any order to the governor and he has to comply. No two ways about it. The Minister of Finance and Cabinet doesn't have to go to Parliament. 
Minister of Finance and Cabinet are in charge of the Bank of Canada if there's a disagreement between the Governor and the Minister of Finance. They make you believe that the Governor is independent and the Minister of Finance can't intervene. That's horseshit. Yeah. Yeah. If you read the history of the Bank of Canada, you, f you recognize that there has been from the beginning that tension between the government and the Bank of Canada. And it's muddied because the Bank of Canada is supposed to operate at arm's length. But there is absolute provision for what Rocco has said about who's really in charge. Who in the end is to blame for what has happened? The governments that have conceded and, and, and agreed to it. And the reason for that is because the shares in the bank, it, it has shares, are held by the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance is the shareholder on behalf of the people of Canada. Yeah, so. Now there's no question at all, okay? No question at all, only comments. Thank, thank you so much. And um, I just would like to remind you, what you are doing right now, it's a very, very tricky matter, okay? Uh, let me tell you, okay, just remind you, Lincoln got shot because of the green backs. Kennedy got shot for the same reason, okay? So, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, but wa I warn you, check your back. Well, I, 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 you know, I, in, nine, in 2003, I was poisoned by security services when I got somebody out of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we understand these things are, you know, I get death threats all the time. I always have. Uh, you know, my father spent uh, time in a Mussolini concentration camp. So when I, when I, of course, thank you for your, you know, a warning. When I think about the danger to myself, I often think of what it took my father to stand up to Mussolini. Uh, that was courage. What I do is I'm exercising a profession, but I refuse to walk and live in fear. <laughs> Thank you, you're too kind. I guess I could take refuge in a bank vault. <laughs> One of my colleagues, you know, most of us are now uh, dead uh, from Cummer. One of my colleagues, though, on the steering committee has said, she's uh, younger, than, a little younger than I am, but she's a senior, and she has said, I believe that the seniors should be in the front of the line. The young people should be behind them. We don't have a lot of time left anyway. And we have the benefit of our experience. So we belong in the front line. I'd just like to recommend highly to you a book by uh, Michael Hudson, who's one of my favorite uh, uh, economists. It's called Finance, Capitalism, and Its Discontents. And it's an anthology of the best of his articles and speeches. And there's one in here particularly that you people must read. It's entitled The Politics of austerity. <laughs> <laughs>